Hello guys, Oscar Hotel 8 Sierra Tango November here from Survival Tech Nord. Today I'd like to introduce you to my latest battery pack build. I call it the Ultra Pack. It's a QRP Plus battery pack, pocket size, enabled to power rigs like your TX500, your IC705, your X6100, your FT818, all in a SOTA or POTA sized package. I'm going to give you a bit of context about why we need such a battery pack. Then we're going to build it and try it out in the field. If you stick with me a while, I'll teach you what I know. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign there. There are certain situations like summits on the air or emergency communications or even preparedness where we want a high-speed, low-drag station. We want a station that is easy to carry, easy to deploy, and doesn't weigh us down or prevent us from carrying other critical gear. This is the ultimate goal of the Ultra Pack. Now, the Ultra Pack is very similar to a pack we built on the channel a couple of years ago. That one was 5 amp hour, 64 watt hours at 12.8 volts. The Ultra Pack is 4S1P lithium iron phosphate pack based on A123 26650 batteries. It's 2.5 amp hours, 32 watt hours at 12.8 volts. If we allowed the pack to do so, we could get 50 amps continuous out of it. But all we're really looking for is 10 to 20 amps, which is absolutely fine. The Ultra Pack weighs in at 356 grams or 12.6 ounces. If you add the Guinness on charge controller, that's 383 grams or 13.6 ounces. This is absolutely outstanding for a pocket size portable power supply which can power a QRP radio for quite a long time, a QRP radio and amplifier for a little bit less time, or a QRO radio at full power for those short portable or lunchtime deployments with your favorite QRO radio. Since we're trying to have a high-speed, low-drag battery pack, we want to build it in the most efficient way possible. Although you've seen me and other YouTubers soldering these battery packs together in previous videos, don't do it. A safer and more pragmatic way to achieve our goals is spot welding the battery packs. My spot welder came from eBay a couple of years ago. It has been reliable, but I'm sure it's not the best model or quality. Now, it has been an excellent investment as far as learning goes. But given the number of potential applications this spot welder might be useful around the shack, I think I'll invest in a better model. But if this one is still available on eBay, I'll leave a link for it in the description. Now, just like the previous 5 amp hour build, we're going to use these 26650 holders to keep all the cells together and properly spaced for good ventilation. Now we have the option to configure the pack as a rectangle or square looking at it from the side or of course a flat pack as I am here so that it packs flat in our backpack or rucksack. The reason this is important is space optimization. There's no point in having such a small pack if it doesn't integrate well with the other equipment we have to carry. So I set up these holders on top and on bottom with the sales oriented plus minus on the first sale and then uh, minus plus minus on top plus on bottom on the second sale. Plus on top and minus on bottom on the third cell, and minus on top and plus on the bottom on the fourth cell. This will give us a 4S series pack. In 
And now we can start preparing the pack for spot welding. The first step in this process is measuring out the strips, which will be spot welded between the tabs of our cells. Keep in mind, the width and thickness of the strips are extremely important. The width relates to the amount of current which will seamlessly travel between the cells. The thickness of our strips is also important in regards to current, but more so important for the spot welder we are using. If you're using the same little cheap eBay spot welder that I have, it's only good for one millimeter strips. Now I've set up my spot welder at an energy level of 40 and I've set it for auto so that I don't have to use the foot pedal. Now since I'm using this pack for my QRP kit, I'm using the one millimeter strips with five millimeter width. I usually make four to six spot welds on each cell solder pad. That's usually enough. Six is definitely enough, provided you've done your practice beforehand and set your energy level correctly. Now, just to keep things clear, I'm by no means a battery spot welding expert, but I did find it useful to practice using scrap strips, spot welding them together. Now, just to add a bit more context to the discussion, the reason we're spot welding versus soldering is soldering presents an enormous amount of heat to the cells. Heat can damage the cells or, at the very least, reduce the cyclic life of the cells. Spot welding, on the other hand, introduces a very high amount of heat, but for a very brief amount of time. Other than binding the two layers together, the strip and the surface of the cell, no long-term damage to the cell is done. Now, the reason we use soldering most of the time, or quite often anyway, is simply because everyone has a soldering iron. A quality battery spot welder is rather costly, especially in comparison to a soldering iron. So more often than not, people will take the risk in soldering the cells together rather than using a spot welder. With the advent of these cheap Chinese spot welders, it's possible to do a quality job spot welding with a relatively small investment. Now, while we're putting this pack together, if you're watching this video on YouTube, why don't you go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. If you're watching the video someplace else, for example, embedded in a blog, Make sure you let them know how much you enjoy my videos and you appreciate them sharing them with you. Another benefit to spot welding is reducing the size and mess created by building these packs ourselves. We can actually do a much better job with spot welding a pack, almost as good as a job as we would see from commercial packs, for example, from Bioina or other companies like that. We also have the benefit of being able to customize the pack or build the pack in whatever form factor we want, square or flat, rectangular, any form factor we actually like, using the cells we like and the components we like. Where many battery manufacturers or battery systems integrators will build their battery packs based on the highest profit margin possible, we can actually DIY build our battery packs basing the build entirely on our technical requirements. So let's move on to the BMS board now. And yes, I am actually using one for this build. Now a BMS board is not a charging circuit. It actually protects the battery from overcharge over discharge, provides short circuit protection and balances the cells. Now the reason we're using the BMS is because we want to directly connect a solar charge controller to our battery packs for charging in the field. Without the BMS board, we'd lose the low voltage protection, over voltage protection, and short circuit protection protecting our costly cells from damage in case of mishaps. Now very often BMS boards come with a wiring loom allowing you to connect it to different parts of the battery pack. 
Since size and weight are extremely important with this build, I decided to use the spot welding strip soldered to the BMS, spot welding the other ends to the correct points on the battery pack itself. So let's go ahead and mate the BMS to the battery pack. So the BMS board is going to be hot glued to the battery pack. Don't go overkill with that and you could also use double sided tape. I ran out so I used hot glue instead. It's important to prepare the BMS by pre-installing the discharge, charge and balance cables beforehand. Now although this does allow us to avoid any unnecessary heat to the cells, it does kind of create this tentacle monster of wires we have to manage. I like to put tape over the contact points and wires I'm not working with, leaving only the place where I'm spot welding exposed. So moving on, here's a little helper for you regarding the connections of the BMS. Now the labels of the connections for your BMS may be different than mine, but the connections themselves are the same regardless of what BMS you use. I'm sure someone's going to ask for a link to the BMS I'm using in the comments, but I've had these for a while. They're changing all the time, and it's best if you find a BMS yourself based on a 4S lithium iron phosphate configuration. But really, the only issue is these BMS boards, they go out of stock, they're unavailable. I'll spend all of my time trying to keep up with broken links. Uh, rather than you doing the research and finding the BMS board yourself. But for those of you in uh, the Americas, I would suggest battery hookups, use my call sign for a discount, and in Europe, shop.lipopower.de. So we've already started soldering, sorry, not soldering, we've already started spot welding the BMS tabs to the pack. Now this is the very first time I've done it. I'm no expert. If you are an expert or you have a lot of experience, go ahead and share how you might do it better in the comments. That information is critical for the rest of us getting it done properly. So please do that. As an example, I shared a spot welding example or, or experiment on Instagram and Instagram user, a thoughtful Marine reached out and said, hey, those spot welds actually look cold. So this was a red flag for me to go back and check my work to see what I was doing wrong. What I actually had to do was reduce the thickness of the spot welding strips I was using because my spot welder wasn't strong enough to spot weld through that thicker strip to the battery pack. So share that experience, guys. It actually helps the rest of us. So here's another tip. When spot welding the BMS to the battery pack, I like to spot weld those connection pads on the same side of the battery pack sequentially. So I'll get the top of the pack done first, put tape over to protect those solder pads or spot welding pads, flip the pack over and then to the underside. This helps us keep the connections we're not interested in out of the way, while we focus on the spot welding pads we are interested in. You may have also noticed I used heat shrink tubing on the spot welding strips between the BMS and the battery pads. Now I've done this to reduce the risk of shorting out any one of those connections on the other. Now this may seem redundant as we're going to cover the battery pack with heat shrink film anyway, but um, I think it's worth the added weight and safety. Okay, while we finish up the spot welding of this pack, let's talk a bit more about why this pack is actually necessary. Now, I've mentioned before, if the battery pack we need for our communications purposes is actually larger than the radio we're using itself, we're probably doing something wrong. Now for radios like the Elecraft KX2, which actually can't be charged externally, 
With solar power while in the field, we need an external battery pack to bridge that gap. For the Lab 599TX500, which doesn't have its own internal battery pack, we need an external battery pack to actually power it up in the field. It's such a small radio that it's ridiculous to carry a 10 amp hour battery or something even larger when we know the design goes of that radio were to be lightweight and extremely portable. Naturally, our portable power supply should be the same. For the ICOM IC705 or Zygu X6100, we use an external power supply like this to get the full power out of that radio, a full 10 watts. For the Yezu FT817 and Yezu FT818, we solve a couple of different problems. Firstly, the extremely slow charging circuit for the internal batteries. If we want to fast charge the Yezu FT818 in real time, it's impossible. We need to do that with an external power supply and a solar panel with charge controller connected to the external battery. And if you want to run full power with data modes or even voice or CW for any significant length of time with the FT818, you need to do so with an external battery. The challenge is finding a battery which won't overload us or take up too much space. So now I've got my fluke meter out and I've added a couple of Anderson power pole connectors to the discharge wires on the battery pack. What we want to check for is voltage on that discharge port. 13.46 volts, I'll take it. If you test and find any other voltage lower than, for example, uh, 12 volts or 11.5 volts, there's probably something wrong with one of the cells. Use your multimeter to check the cells individually to make sure voltage is where it should be. If you find you have zero volts on the multimeter, you can bypass the BMS by using your voltage uh, probes on the plus and minus of the battery pack itself. If you get voltage from the pack, it means you need to activate the BMS. As soon as you plug in the charger to the BMS, the BMS will become active. So, there you have it guys. A 4S1P lithium iron phosphate 32 or 33 watt hour pocket portable battery pack for your MAM portable operations. Now one thing I didn't cover in this video was the charge controller. I'll use the Genesan GV5 mod. The GV5 mod is an embedded version of the GV5 we normally use on the channel. More about that in the next video. So, some size comparisons with the Zygu X6100, the ICOM IC705, the Yezu FT817 and 818, and finally, the Lab 599TX500. Now let me know what you think. Do you like these DIY battery packs? You know, we'll also be covering some commercial or pre-built battery packs on the channel like we have in the past, so keep an eye out for those. With that, I say, if you like what I'm doing, if you like the content I'm sharing, please leave me a comment and or a thumbs up to let me know. And if it's not too much to ask, please share this content with someone or somewhere where other operators might find some value from it. Rock and roll, guys. As always, thanks for watching. Ciao.